Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that has had all, like all of the technological problems today. And I'm currently just obsessing over how infuriating planned obsolescence is. I mean, very long story short, it looks like I'm going to have to buy another computer, which just makes me so angry because the stuff is not cheap. And you know what happens to it when I'm done with it? Don't worry. I'm already researching what happens with computers when we're done with them. (laughs) That's not what this episode is about. In fact, I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 141. Today's guest is someone most of you already know, a listener favorite for sure, Alex of St. Evans. Today, she and I are going to talk about something that, to be honest, can evoke some pretty defensive reactions. That's cultural appropriation. The few times I have posted about this on Instagram, I've received some pretty, let's say visceral, (laughs) very visceral, raw reactions. And you know what? I think that's because we're all afraid of being bad people, of hurting someone by accident. No one wants to do that. We all want to do the best we can. And thinking that we may have made a misstep along the way is, it's excruciating. Don't think about that right now. Put that fear of being a bad person aside. I would ask all of you to listen to this episode with an open mind, open ears, and an open heart to know that this conversation is not meant to shame you for things you have done or worn in the past, but to help you be an active part of a better future where no one feels like a joke or a footnote. In our conversation, Alex will be breaking down the different types of cultural appropriation and will be sharing some examples ripped from the headlines. We'll also talk about why it's not okay to get like approval for potentially wrong choices from one person of that race or cultural group. Seriously, it's so unfair. And we will differentiate between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. This is another long episode, definitely one that I did not want to cut in half. I think it's so powerful that it should just live on its own. So we're going to jump right into the conversation, and then I'll be back at the end to wrap things up. Alex, you're kind of a regular around here at this point, but why don't you go ahead and reintroduce yourself, remind everyone of who you are. Okay, um, it has been a minute since I've been on Close Horse, but I am so happy to be back. Thank you for having me, Amanda, as always. Um, my name is Alex. I'm based in New York City. I run a vintage clothing brand called St. Evans. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a topic that is really important to me. And I think that it's something that has affected me personally, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and writing about it. And I, I think this conversation comes up a lot at this time of year, but it's really a conversation we should be having year round um, yes. because it goes beyond Halloween. It goes beyond costumes and it really is incredibly systemic across all kinds of industries, right? Oh yeah, definitely. And that is cultural appropriation. Yes. So, I mean, there is cultural appropriation, you know, we see it in fashion, clothing, hairstyles and makeup, you know, which is very like topical with the podcast, but also you see it in um, food culture really often. Mm -hmm. Um, You see it in all different types of like art and culture, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's definitely something that comes up a lot this time of year. Um, Unfortunately, we're basically counting down the days now until a well-known public figure or celebrity shows up somewhere wearing something offensive. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it will happen. It happens every single year. So who's it going to be this year and what are they going to wear? It's true. It's sort of like we made it through Coachella without that, at least as far as I'm aware of. And I think it's because Coachella was still a little bit smaller this year mm-hmm. because of the pandemic. But normally we get our first introduction to this during festival season, right? Yeah. And then, of course, Often the same celebrity who did something pretty offensive and unthoughtful at uh, Coachella then brings it in a bigger way for Halloween. (laughs) Yep, that sounds about right. (laughs) So, yeah, yeah, I feel like this is a topic that um, 
has really only become part of mainstream conversation more recently. Um, it's certainly not something new, but in terms of it being a frequent conversation and something that people are really having a lot of discussion around is relatively new for a lot of people. Um, so I think that there's a lot of nuance here that I kind of want to break down so that people can have a better understanding of the different types of appropriation, um, you know, how different types of appropriation can be harmful and why it's so important to talk about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to just preface this by saying that a lot of people shut down when this conversation gets started. And I yeah. think there are a variety of reasons why, but it all really comes back to, you know, what's happening inside our minds emotionally when someone brings up the topic of cultural appropriation. Maybe it's because we feel like guilty. Maybe mm -hmm. it's because we feel like we're being I don't know. I, we're going to go into this, but like we can't just do what we want. Or maybe yeah. it's just, it's one of those things that we need to take some time later and think through everything we've just, we're about to hear, right? And so if cultural appropriation is something that you've heard out there, but don't know a lot about, or you're thinking like, oh, I think I may have been guilty of this in the past. I want you to know that what's important is that you take what you're going to hear today and you think about it and you adapt it to your life and this is just like what you take with you moving forward. Because Absolutely. like Alex said, I was trying to think when I first started to hear these conversations happening in a more significant way. And as I was like going back and trying to pinpoint the time in my life, I was sort of surprised to find that I'm not even sure if it was a full 10 years ago when this, these conversations started. And what was specifically making me think that it may not have even been that long ago is I was thinking about in the late aughts and the early aughties, there were all of those, like Pendleton blew up, right? Mm -hmm. And there was that collab with opening ceremony and people were obsessed with Pendleton. And I never really heard very much about what was problematic about that. And I, I even feel sort of like I'm soft shooing around it by saying uh, problematic, but unethical. I guess I'm just going to say like, I have a lot of issues with Pendleton, which we will talk about here later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people were barely, I mean, there were whispers here and there about like, hey, there might be something a little wrong with the print that Pendleton uses, but I mean, it was very like, oh no, it, whatever. It was drowned out by every magazine article about the Pendleton Portland collection and right. you know every blog and people wearing it. And I mean, at that point I was working at Urban Outfitters and we were definitely copying those prints, mm -hmm. uh, which is unethical as well. Yeah. And it, people weren't really talking about it. So it's, it's really disappointing that this isn't a conversation that hasn't been happening for decades or hundreds of years, but I mean, that's where we are right now. But that was then, and this is now. And this is yeah. a time where we, we are going to think about these things and we're going to do better. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is definitely something that I would assume that almost everyone is guilty of at some point. Um, I've definitely participated in cultural appropriation throughout my lifetime. Um, it's a lot of it is just a product of being uninformed and mm -hmm. not having a good understanding of what it is you're purchasing, what it is that you're participating in. And, you know, we're going to break down some of that a little bit more, but, you know, it, you it's hard to avoid if you don't know what it is or you don't know that you're doing it. So really like, you know, like you said, you just want to take this information and try and be more aware and more conscious moving forward. And yeah, that's really the best that any of us can do in any situation in which you look back and you're like, wow, you know, maybe my behavior was not the best that it could have been. Yeah, exactly. Listen, uh, my brain is a database of every embarrassing thing I've ever done. <laughs> I'm sure yours is too. You just lie awake <laughs> at night thinking about that weird thing you said like a year and a half like, ago. <laughs> or 15 years ago, whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, and you know, like, that's human nature as well too. If you're a good person, which I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you are, you are already thinking about these things and you are thinking about how you can do better in every day. And this this is one of those things. I, When I see conversations like this happening on social media, you know, I see a vast majority of people are like on board, get it, or like, yes, 
Mm-hmm. But then there are those people who, and they kind of raise the same arguments time and yep. time again, which I, oh, yeah. I know you're going to talk like, about right? those. Yeah. I, right. And one of those is this like, uh, it's just these social justice warriors, you know, nobody can do what they want anymore. Like these, these liberals, these progressives are really just fascists who don't let anyone do what they want. Mm-hmm. It's all this like, I want to do what I want behavior. You yep. know? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, obviously those arguments are foolish, but it's always the people who are speaking most uh, loudly about that kind of freedom who then want to usurp on other freedoms that people have and should oh, have yeah. that of are course. legit. Yeah, right? Yep, very hypocritical. <laughs> very, very. Yep. So I did want to preface this conversation a little bit by just talking about um, myself personally. Um, I am half Japanese and half white. Um, I grew up moving around a lot. I lived in Asia in my childhood. I've lived in different parts of America. Um, I, you know, have grown up around a lot of different types of people in different, you know, racial groups, different ethnic backgrounds. And I just wanted to say that, you know, when I am talking here, I'm not speaking for anyone else. I'm not speaking for the Japanese community. I'm not speaking for the half Japanese community. Um, You know, all of these conversations, there is so much nuance here that there is no one person that represents any group. And, you know, you see this a lot in these conversations. Oh, well, you know, my friend is okay with it or my friend thought it was funny. (sighs) And the thing is, is that, you know, as the same with we all have a different sense of taste. We all have a different sense of humor. We also all have different levels of what we feel comfortable with. So just because one person is comfortable with something or thinks that something is okay or not okay, it does not mean that other people agree with them. So I just kind of wanted to put that out he- out there before we start talking that, you know, I'm in no way trying to speak for anyone. I just kind of wanted to shed some light on generally what this sort of behavior looks like and how we can discuss it. I think that a lot of times we see appropriation happening and it makes us uncomfortable, but we're not necessarily able to articulate why. Mm-hmm. So I feel like breaking down the types of appropriation and why each type is harmful or inappropriate really helps people kind of approach these situations with this sense of understanding. And you're then able to express, hey, I don't think that we should be doing this. And here's why. And yeah, that's just I, super I mean, I love important. that. Yeah. I think in most cases, You know that something feels off when you encounter cultural appropriation, but like you said, you don't know how to articulate that. And most certainly, when you don't feel confident articulating it, you don't feel confident calling it out. Yeah, it's really really hard to say like, hey, I don't think you should do that, but I can't explain to you why. You know, right. like, yeah, it, it, that's not very, and it's also just not effective. Like, people aren't going to listen to that. This no. is already a difficult conversation to have. It's very difficult to approach someone and say, hey, I think you did something wrong. Um, it's hard to do. It's also hard to hear. So I think that the more understanding you're able to have around this topic, the easier it is to actually approach that in a way that's kind and respectful and in a way that people might be more receiving of. So... You know, like you had mentioned before, when a instance of cultural appropriation does show up and it's a conversation topic, a bunch of people are chiming in on it, there are kind of two, like, takes that I see of people arguing against it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And the two responses that you usually see are the response A, which is like, no one's allowed to do anything anymore. No Uh one knows how to take a joke. No one has a sense of humor these days type comments and then there's the people who are like who cares people just want something to be upset about this doesn't Uh. actually matter everyone's so sensitive that kind of thing so that first group of people that's upset that you know quote unquote no one's allowed to wear what they want these days I think that people get really caught up in this idea of being not allowed to do things. Yeah. Um, and this particularly <laughs> applies towards white, cishet people, especially men. Um, and I think that a lot of it has to do with that this is the first time that a lot of restrictions have been placed on these groups in particular. Yeah. You know, historically, people in power have been able to do whatever they want. 
um, if people were offended by it or hurt by it, like, no one could speak up or do anything. And, in fact, these people were often the ones that were creating the rules and regulations that everyone else was required to abide by. So, you know, if you're, if the group that you belong to culturally and historically has always been able to do whatever and you're now being told, actually, here are some things that you shouldn't be doing, like, I think that's just, it's a weird thing for people to have to face and they're just not used to it. Yeah, yeah. And I do like to think, although I often am very naively optimistic about certain things, that when people are called out on this in a constructive way, right, that even if at first glance or first hearing, I guess, they are defensive or don't want to hear it or like whatever, you just want to be upset. I do like to believe that they walk away and later they think about it and they think like, okay, you know what, there might be something there. Like, yeah, I, think I hope you shouldn't I hope be afraid so. to speak up about this is what I'm saying, you know? Totally. And also, same goes for the people who are maybe put in this situation where someone is approaching them and telling them that they did something that could have, you know, was offensive. If your first reaction is to feel very defensive, very upset and say, no, you're wrong. I didn't do that. And you walk away from it and really think about it. Like you're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to go back and say, hey, listen, I thought a lot more about what you said and I'm sorry I reacted that way. You know, it was an emotional reaction and I've thought about it and I've actually changed my mind. Like we right. really, like, like let's normalize changing our minds. We don't need to be set in one way of thinking. We don't need to be set in one opinion. Like it is totally okay to take some time, mull it over and come back with a totally different perspective. Exactly. We've all made mistakes in our lives. We've all done the wrong things where it becomes a big problem is if you never learn from that. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, I think in this in this sense, we really need to start shifting the narrative away from the quote-unquote rights of the appropriator, and we really need to start thinking about the feelings, the history, and the significance of the cultures that are being appropriated. You know, this conversation, it's not about telling people that they aren't allowed to do things. It's about holding people accountable when they choose to do things that are harmful or offensive. In the same way that you're allowed to do what you want to do, people are also allowed to react to your behavior in the way that they want to. (laughs) So like if you genuinely believe in the quote unquote freedom of wearing what you want or styling your clothes how you want, then you also believe in the freedom of people publicly critiquing your choices. Like it goes both ways. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that is, that is a hard pill for some people to swallow. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely is. And we see it, you know, again, we see these comments all the time. It's such a common comment, like no one knows how to take a joke and that kind of thing. And I think that, yeah, that's really what it boils down to. Another important point here is that a lot of times when these behaviors are being punished, they're being punished by like private companies, institutions, and businesses. So when you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm not allowed to wear this costume anymore, like, you know, your rights aren't being infringed upon. You're not being, like, arrested. You're, you know, it's at your job or at your school or, say, you create an account on a social media site or you sit down at a restaurant. Like, in those situations, you're required to abide by the rules of that particular establishment. You know, saying whatever you want on, like, Twitter, that's not protected by free speech. Twitter is a private company. They have their own rules. And if you break those rules, they're allowed to kick you off the website. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they don't do it enough. Yeah, and same goes with, you know, people being fired from their jobs or being kicked out of schools. Like, there are codes of conduct at most universities. And, of course, if you think that that code of conduct is problematic and there are issues within that, that's a whole separate conversation to have. And, like, (laughs) you know, you may very well be right in that regard. However, there are still rules. And, you know, those aren't, like, that's free speech does not cover your behavior at, like, a private establishment. That's not how that works. (laughs) <laughs> um, I think a lot of people get very confused there and they conflate oh. this idea of like America and freedom as like I can do <laughs> anything I want anywhere and like that is not how that works. It is true though that that is like when people are, I mean you know, there's a lot of that going on right now with social media where people feel there's like I don't know it's a little bit of a conspiracy theory in fact it's not a little bit it's a lot of it that social media is trying to silence right-wing voices Mm -hmm. conservative voices Mm -hmm. i think is probably what they would call themselves and i'm like uh did you see what you guys were posting yeah you know (laughs) yeah like these 
social media platforms you're posting on, they are private companies. They have yeah. rules. And again, if you think the rules are flawed, that's a separate conversation to be having. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so then we've got the other group of people who are like, everyone's so sensitive. Who cares? This doesn't actually uh. matter. Like, there are more important ha- things happening in the world. So to this, I just have to say that the reactions to these behaviors, they haven't actually changed. They've always been harmful. Like PC culture isn't to blame for people suddenly being upset. Um, In the past, people just didn't know that you were participating in appropriation or they didn't have a safe or effective way to call you out for it. So if you're just now finding out that people think something is offensive it's not because people just decided to be offended it's because (laughs) you're just finding out that people have always felt this way this is true yeah it's (laughs) it's not new and the thing is is that okay so say you wore an offensive costume to a halloween party you know Mm -hmm. if you went to a party in the 80s in this costume if there is not a person at that party from that marginalized group there's a good chance that no one at that event is offended by this. You're not posting the photo anywhere publicly that people can see. So, like, how are the marginalized group that you're then stereotyping, how are they even going to know that you, you wore this costume? They won't. And so they things won't. have changed so much now that now everyone's posting everything, and now people are seeing this behavior, and they're calling it out. Yeah. And in the past also, you know, especially in Western society, white supremacy has prevented marginalized communities from speaking up. It was often unsafe for people to say anything. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it could literally put your life in danger to speak out. And if it were not necessarily an issue of safety, it's also just like, it's a social thing, you know? Like, growing up, I, you know, the second half of high school, I went to a very, very white high school. I was one of the only students in the entire school that wasn't white. And I often found myself laughing along with jokes that I found really offensive because I don't like, you know, you want to be cool. You want to be chill. You don't want to be all of the stereotypical, angry, you know, upset POC Mm -hmm. that's getting offended at everything and can't take a joke and whatever. And especially when you're a young person, like that desire to fit in and that desire to be accepted by your peers, I think really trumps over the desire to stand up for what's right, especially in a situation like that. Yeah, absolutely. I And I will say like, if you're listening to this and you're white, um, if you are a woman, if you are not straight, I think you can also understand. Oh, absolutely. You can understand this. And, right. a, and, you know, appropriation applies to all marginalized groups. Like, you know, queer culture can be appropriated. Um, mm-hmm. You know, trans culture can be appropriated. Like, it isn't just about race. Obviously, a bulk of our conversation is about race and ethnicity. But it goes far beyond that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then you've got the people who are like, who cares? Why does this matter? Ugh. To those people, I just have to say, you are purposely missing the point. If you are entering in on this discussion, it means that people care enough to create the content that you're commenting on in the first place. Like, if no one cared, we wouldn't even be talking about it. If you're commenting on a TikTok, if you're commenting on a news article, like, that means that people not only cared enough to create this content, but the content has enough traction that you're now seeing it when you're clearly not the target audience here. Oh my God, I love the people who, who are like, who cares, but care enough to write a comment that says, who cares? Exactly. And so, I mean, (laughs) basically, if you say who cares, what you're actually saying is, I don't care about these people's feelings. So, like, just say that then. Yeah, just say that. It's like, take a moment and think about, I mean... I don't think anybody who's listening to this conversation is is of the who cares variety. I hope but not. <laughs> if you are, if you're some, if you're like hate listening to this episode, um, just as you want to be angry at us, uh, I would ask you to take a step back and say like, okay, so wait a minute, do you really not care about other people and how they feel? Because that is what you are saying mm-hmm. when you Absolutely. say who cares. And, or even when you say nobody can do anything anymore or whatever, what you're saying is, I don't really care about how other people feel. Yep. And what person would actually feel comfortable like making that statement? Absolutely. And that's what so much of appropriation is, especially when it comes to 
forms of appropriation that have been such a large topic of a conversation that I would be really surprised by most people like being unaware of it, you know? And again, we're talking specifically about America, about Western culture, but like take someone wearing a indigenous headpiece to a festival as an example, like that's been publicly lambasted so often now that like, I think we'd be hard pressed to find someone who had absolutely no idea that that was seen as insensitive So if you have that information and you are continuing to engage in that behavior, again, all you're saying is, I don't care. That's what it is. You're saying, I don't care that people are upset by this. I don't care that it's offensive. I don't care about the community that I'm misrepresenting. And people are allowed to say, okay, well, I think that sucks. And I think that you're an asshole for not caring. (laughs) 100%. 100%. And once again, like, would you really say that you don't care? I, like, it's just yeah, I, to me. I hope not, but, like, I, yeah, in these situations, it's hard to say. And so then, you know, for the people who, again, with the who cares stuff, or, like, you know, why does this really matter? Is it a big deal? There are more important things happening in the world. Um, this is something you talk about a lot on the podcast, but all of these things are interconnected, you know? right white supremacy, poverty, like systemic inequity, those things are all wrapped up in one. They're not separate from each other. Nothing exists in a bubble. So appropriation plays a large part in that. I mean, the theft of like art and our ideas that can directly harm the creators of this art. You know, we talk about plagiarism so extensively in school. We talk about stealing ideas with no credit. And we talk about how, you know, that's unethical and immoral like you'll get kicked out of school for doing that and yet we're allowed to somehow do that when we're out in the world and expect people not to like have any repercussions for that yeah I mean when you say it like that it's just ridiculous yeah it really is and then on top of that you know appropriation it can perpetuate really harmful stereotypes and these stereotypes can lead to discrimination, bullying, fetishization. I mean, they can even lead to physical violence. Like, you know, it's obviously not a direct point A to point B, but consuming appropriated content and seeing people normalize like harmful stereotypes and mockery, that normalizes that behavior. And that creates Mm -hmm. ideas in people's head that lead them to commit hate crimes, to, you know, become radicalized. And it's all it's all very connected. It's not its own separate thing. And then on top of that, appropriation really contributes to the erasure and the whitewashing of culture and art. Um, You know, we love to take something from a very specific community and kind of strip it of all its identifying factors. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then really it, like we said before, it just boils down to respect. Um, there are some forms of cultural appropriation that are genuinely respectful. Um, most of them aren't, uh, it's just be respectful. That's really all it is. Be respectful of other people. And if you are not respectful by accident, you know, apologize and fix the behavior. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, another argument that I hear a lot that is adjacent to this is like, well, it's not cultural appropriation, it's cultural appreciation. Have you heard this one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, once again, I would say, like, appreciating whom? You know, like, if if this makes other people feel bad, mm-hmm. then I don't really think you're appreciating anything. Oh, yeah. Yep, then that, I'll get a little bit more into that when I get to one of my points here, which I guess we can dive into now. Yeah, let's dive into it because there are a lot of different types of cultural appropriation. They're adjacent, but they're different. And I think as we walk through these, you're going to see how they permeate so many different aspects of our life. They go beyond Halloween costumes or even clothing. Absolutely. Let's take a moment to thank a new supporter of Clothes Horse. 
Athletic Greens. They have a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because it's important that I feel as healthy and energized as possible. If I'm going to be able to do all the stuff I need to do in a given day, from working my day job, to creating clothes horse, to reading my ever-growing mountain of books. This means I need a supplement that fits into my life easily and is actually enjoyable to take. I've taken some very unenjoyable supplements. For a while, it seemed like half my suitcase for every business trip was just bottles of vitamins, and AG1 has changed my life because it only takes up a tiny, tiny bit of space in my bag, and I really enjoy taking it. Who says that about a supplement? I have never said that before, but I mean it. I've been on it for a few months now, and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It has a kind of mild tropical with a hint of vanilla taste that I actually look forward to each morning. I'm I'm serious. I, I'm excited to drink it in the morning. So you're probably asking, like, what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of the things you care about. It's very lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, or only Taco Bell, AG1 fits for you. It also costs you less than $3 a day. It's way cheaper, trust me, I did the math, than getting all of the different supplements yourself, which I appreciate as a very thrifty person. I also love that I'm skipping all of the plastic packaging ways for all of the supplements I was taking in the past. So many containers. I am not an athlete. When I do work out, it's in very uncool pajamas. But AG1 is a small micro habit with big benefits for me. It's one thing I can do every single day to take great care of myself. For every purchase, Athletic Greens donates to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the United States. In 2020 alone, AG donated over 1.2 million meals to kids. My other vitamins weren't doing anything for anybody else except filling up my suitcase. Right now is a great time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. Shake it up and enjoy it. There's no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. Seriously, the first thing I do every morning, well, first I feed the cats, but then I mix up my scoop of of AG1 with some water. I shake it up and I sit on the couch and drink it while I listen to NPR and it is delightful. To make it easy, because I know you're so jealous, you want to try this now, Athletic Greens is going to offer you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash clotheshorse. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash clotheshorse to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So I think the first type of cultural appropriation is just mockery. Um, It's probably like the most easy to spot. You can identify it very easily. Um, And this is one that, again, we see a lot of around Halloween. Um, It's just, you know, something that's, it's just offensive. It's a stereotype. It's portraying a culture or a group of people in a negative light or making fun of them. Um, If you're wearing any sort of costume that has like a ethnic or cultural aspect to it, like it shouldn't be a joke. (laughs) You know, it it really, it really shouldn't be funny unless it's your own culture. That is a totally different thing. But like if you're wearing the outfit of a different culture than you, it better not be for funny reasons because it's probably not funny. I know. I mean, uh, my hope is that there is no one listening to this podcast who would ever do that because that, I mean, that said, I I see it out there. Oh, I mean, I was literally at a store yesterday and I saw a 
costume. Oh, what was it called? It was called like tequila chugging dude. And it was a quote unquote Mexican guy costume. No. Like, I thought it was going to be a frat boy. Now that would be no, funny. No, no. It was, uh, uh. it was like, you know, with a fake mustache and a poncho and it, it was for sale yesterday. Like, this is not something that's gone away. It's still available to buy at the store. There are plenty of people who are going to go buy it and wear it. Uh. Um, uh. And for this, too, it's really important to note the historical context of, you know, these types of quote-unquote jokes, um, what the different stereotypes are, what different racial tropes are. There are a lot of things that you may not perceive to be offensive if you don't have a clear understanding of the culture and history of how different communities have been marginalized. So, you know, if something doesn't seem offensive to you and someone says, hey, actually, you know, this term was used derogatorily towards this group 50 years ago and someone's now bringing it, you know, as a costume or a joke or whatever, you know, you want to take that knowledge, think about it and be like, okay, you know, this wasn't something bad from what I saw at first, but there's deeper meaning there. Totally. Yeah, agreed. So that one's like pretty cut and dry. I feel like it's just, for the most part, it's pretty obvious. Um, Mm -hmm. Number two is misappropriation. And this one's a little bit more complicated. So this is generally when you incorrectly attribute a cultural practice or you generalize like an entire race or continent. So this goes from, you know, calling a robe a kimono, um, calling all headscarves burka, if you were to describe a Thai dish as Chinese, or if you were to take a textile from a specific African country and call it ethnic or tribal. Um, And worst case scenario, symbolism or artifacts with a religious or spiritual or ceremonial meaning or being misused or misattributed. I would say that that's probably like the worst offender in this camp um, Mm -hmm. is, yeah, taking things that have a deep, important cultural significance to people and turning it into like jewelry or a t-shirt. Oh, I just, you and I, when you and I were preparing for this episode, I was telling you, like, as a person who's worked in the fashion industry for so long now this is just a recurring nightmare that i've had to deal with yeah and like i have to tell you that there are very few situations in my career where i've had this conversation with someone and it was productive Mm -hmm. because like if you think that it's hard to go up to some asshole at a party and tell him that his costume is racist uh, imagine i want to tell you that it's like ten thousand times harder to go to your boss at work and say like, hey, we can't sell this. Yeah, I can't can't buy this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, the whole ethnic, I sort of like, I don't know, snarkily laughed to myself when you talked about people calling textiles ethnic or tribal Mm -hmm. because those were literally attributes in the system of the big fashion retailer. And 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 you still see it all the time. If you go on to like... Uh, online right now and type those words in with like pants shirt blanket like you would find hundreds and thousands of items being sold with those specific keywords which i mean they just i full body cringe when i hear either of those words you know especially being applied to clothing or home decor and this idea of like it's, I mean, I'm going to call something out right now that I'm seeing a lot. And this is something I've actually had to deal with at my current job where we were selling a lot of stuff that we were, this is before I joined the company that was being attributed as like the spiritual products, Mm -hmm. things that were like for people who are into spirituality. And they were, I know that no one had any bad intent intentions here, right? Like I know no one was trying to hurt someone, but there would be packages that were like um, amalgamation of Muslim and Hindu prints on them. And I'm like, that's, who's this? This is for some like clueless, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it's some clueless white lady who yep. is like, I'm spiritual, mm-hmm. who's going to buy this candle that has all these mixtures of sacred iconography on them that should not live together. She certainly doesn't know what any of these mean. And the company that's making products like that is doing a disservice to both the groups of people that they are you know, appropriating and the consumers out there who are never going to learn any better. And I just, it, it, 
oh, this is like one of those things like I feel like I have been fighting with with people about for years. Like I've always been that like person at work who's like, um, oh, you're too sensitive or you think about things too much. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is this is messed up. I mean, honestly, like even for me, you know, I, I am white, but I also am what people would call white trash. I grew up in a trailer park and I had to live through the 90s and the early aughts with people for reasons I cannot understand appropriating what it is to be a poor white person in a trailer park <laughs> and being like, oh my God, it's so white trash. I mean, Dustin told me a story about being asked to DJ a white trash party. And oh, he was just yep. like, no. I remember hearing about parties like that. I feel like that was a pretty common <sighs> like college party theme in like the early 2000s for whatever reason. Yeah, gross, gross. And like, I, you know, I'm not even sure if that is like purely, that's not really cultural appropriation as much as it is like just mocking poor people. It is. It's it's mockery. And yeah, again, it's, these terms are all very nuanced and I don't know that it would count, but also like, does it not count? I don't, you know, it's, you're still making fun of a group of people in a way that's very insensitive. Um, And I think that, you know, you would be in the right to say, hey, like, I don't think this is cool. I think it's really mean and I find it very hurtful. Right, right. And if you would hear about, if like you just heard us talk about a white trash party and you were disgusted and thought that that was so cruel and rude, then I want you to understand it's similar and just as offensive to like make a candle that has a mixture of different religious iconography on it that has nothing to do with your own culture and it's just being commodified as a product for people who are quote spiritual if you think a white trash party sounds okay we need to have a conversation too (laughs) that's a different conversation (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean here's the thing misappropriation it basically just comes down to being wrong Um, Yeah, unfortunately, that is what it is. That's really what it is, is that, like, factually, you are misrepresenting the facts, you're misrepresenting the idea, the concept, whatever it is that you have here, it's just incorrect. And, you know, it can definitely be intentional. I think this is one of the most common types of appropriation, and I think most people participate in this to some degree, myself included. And this is just because we aren't taught or exposed to enough global culture. Absolutely. It's such an educational opportunity. Absolutely. Especially in the West, especially with our education system. Like, our knowledge of geography is straight up embarrassing compared to other countries. We are not taught about cultures of the world. We're just not given enough information to actually approach these things with, like, the right facts. And I think that this can largely be avoided by just being conscious of what you're consuming. So if you really think about, like, where is this object that I'm buying coming from? Does the person who either makes it or sells it know what they're talking about? You know, who made this item? Who's actually profiting off of the sale of this item? You know, who owns this store? Who owns this restaurant? Mm -hmm. Like, if you think about all of those things as you're moving through the world and buying clothes, jewelry, food, I think that you can actually avoid a lot of this by just, you know, approaching it the right way. This is one of those moments where you can shut down Mm -hmm. and be like, nobody can do anything anymore, or cover your ears, or walk away, pause this episode, whatever. But really, this is like the beginning of a a knowledge opportunity for you. And like I would say for me, learning more about different kinds of people and people in the world as a whole is one of life's greatest pleasures. I agree. And this is like, this can be the first day of the rest of your life, basically, is what I'm saying. Absolutely. It is definitely a learning opportunity. And as with anything else, like, again, if you say something and it is factually incorrect and someone says, hey, actually, you know, that movie didn't come out in 1975. It came out in 1977. You would just go, oh, oops, I didn't realize I, you know, I didn't know. And then now you know in the future. It's very similar in a situation like this. If you say, oh, you know, that's my favorite Indian dish. And they go, oh, actually, that's a Pakistani dish. You would go, oh, my God, I had no idea. And then you might go look it up. You know, that's an opportunity for you to learn more about Pakistani cuisine. And that might be your new favorite food, you know? Yeah, 
actually Pakistani cuisine is great. You should go out and have some right now. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that a really good example that I've come up with that I think frames this in a way that everyone can understand, because again, we've talked about this. If you're not part of any marginalized community, it can be more difficult for you to maybe put yourselves in someone's shoes and think about Mm -hmm. why this is so harmful. So I think that a good example is, okay, say me, Alex, and you, Amanda, are each making art, right? We're both artists. We both have our art that we're selling. Somebody buys your art. They love it. And they like take it home. They put it up and they're showing it to all their friends and their family. And they're like, oh, don't you love this art? Alex made it. And you're like, oh, actually, I made that. And they go, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Or, (laughs) Or even worse, they go, oh, Alex, that's you. You're Alex. The same thing. Right. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that is a really great way to explain it, that's, for sure. That's what it is. And it's like, that is harmful. And it doesn't matter if, you know, maybe your art and my art are similar. We might both be painters. We might both use a very similar color palette. We might both be really inspired by Matisse. But it's still not the same thing. It doesn't matter if we draw our inspiration from similar sources. If visually, to the untrained eye, it looks, quote-unquote, the same, it's not the same. It's coming from two different people. We are two distinct individuals. Mm -hmm. And it's disrespectful to say otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great, simple way to break it down. And, you know, I think we've probably all had moments in our lives where we felt as if we didn't get credit for our work or someone else took credit for it. And when we called it out, if we felt brave enough to call it out and people, people probably dismissed us. Yeah. It sucks. It really sucks. It's a terrible feeling. It really is. Exactly. And you know, when someone says, oh, you know, oh, Chinese, Japanese, same thing. That is, you know, that is saying two distinct and extremely different cultures that each have, you know, millions and millions of people within their communities and that have then so many subcultures within those countries are all one big blob and it's all the same. It's just wrong. It's just not true. (laughs) I mean, think about here in the United States, if you said that like Southern people are the same as people from the Pacific Northwest, they would be butthurt. People would be butthurt, right? Oh, yeah. Well, and <laughs> worse than that. <laughs> and I think that it's so interesting that, like, because of white supremacy, because of Western imperialism, there has been this importance placed on learning about Western culture, learning about white culture, mm-hmm. European culture. So, like, we in the West have a very clear understanding of the difference between Italians and Germans, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. we know it's not the same. We know the culture is different even though they're both, like, white cultures, they're both from the same continent, we have a very distinct understanding that the food is different, the language is different, the art style is different, and, like, you would never wear lederhosen and call it a European costume. That's weird. That's (laughs) weird. (laughs) (laughs) But But, but people would be so quick to correct you. They'd be so quick to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. For you know, sure, for that's sure. That's from a specific country in Europe. Yeah. It's not all of Europe. But, like, why can you have, a, you know, African textile? Like, okay, that's a continent. Where in Africa? I know. When I hear that, well, you know, there are a lot of people who think that Africa is a country. Which is, uh, that's which a once whole, again goes, uh, Yeah, I know. This goes back to this idea that, like, people, we need more education. Absolutely. Right? And unfortunately, you know what? You didn't get it in school. Nope. So... Learn it on your own. Learning is great. Yeah. You know, that's just, that's just where we are. I mean, I hear this constantly where, you know, I guess Australia is its own continent. So, like, fine. That's, like, the one ex- – that's the only country that is a whole continent. And yet I hear people speak about Asia as a monolith. Mm-hmm. I hear people talk about Africa as a monolith. I hear people talk about South America but call it Mexico. I mean, like, this – we we need to learn. We need to teach ourselves and hopefully, you know, teach others – by our example, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really, and that's the thing too, is that like we are now at a point in time and in society in Western culture that we have access to this information. So there's, no, we don't really have that many excuses for not Mm-mm. doing the work, at least like the minimal amount of work it takes to just sit there and Google something really quick and be like, hey, where does this come from actually? Like you can figure it out. And if you don't want to, again, it just comes down to you saying, I don't care enough to do this. 
That is what it is. And once again, say that out loud. Yeah. Imagine saying that to someone. I don't care enough. Yeah. That's. No one wants to, no one would say that. Yeah. I mean, maybe like 1% of people, but those people are, you know, they have other issues. <laughs> but yeah, so I think really like misappropriation just comes down to being wrong. Um, it's mm-hmm. something we all do. It's something that is relatively easy to correct. There's like a very cut and dry correction there. Like I said this wrong. Here is what's actually right. Here's what I meant to say. You inform yourself, you educate yourself, and then you move on and you don't make that mistake in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the next form of appropriation is staking claims slash taking credit. So this is when someone claims that they invented or improved upon a practice that's not from their own culture. And this also includes stripping identifying information. So like we said, labeling a garment as like ethnic, that's also Mm -hmm. kind of taking credit for it because like you're not giving credit to anyone. I mean, generally, when the term ethnic is used, like, it's basically interchangeable for not white. Yeah. So, like, are you giving credit to every single non-white person? Like, that's the global majority. Like, that's not giving credit to anyone. Once again, that's like if you created a piece of art and someone just said, this is woman art. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. You're not giving credit to anyone. So, yeah. That is included in staking claims. Um, It's also when someone is profiting from a practice that's not within their own culture. And this is especially more so if they are not using the wealth, the, you know, advancements in society in order to give back to that culture in a significant way. And not to say that giving back to the culture makes it right, but... If you are profiting off of it and you are successful via this venture, you're definitely way less prone to be receiving rightful criticism if you are finding a way to use that to support this community. Mm -hmm. So this this specific version of appropriation happens most often surrounding like public figures or businesses. It's a lot less about individual behavior. So some, like, recent examples, um, right now there's this big thing going on with Hailey Bieber. Um, It is all over TikTok. She (laughs) apparently put on, like, brown lip liner and a clear gloss and called it a brownie glazed lip. And people (laughs) very quickly were like, hey, this is something that black women and Latina women have been doing forever, Um, It is not new to Hailey Bieber. She did not invent anything. And I don't think that she – she didn't claim to have invented it. Mm -hmm. However, I think that a lot of the issue with things that happen like this with public figures is not necessarily solely her fault, but it's also a lot about the media revolving around it. Absolutely. So, you know – While she does have some responsibility as a figure who has this very large platform in order to do her research, like she has all the resources available to her, the fault also lies in media companies picking this up and being like, hot new fall fashion, a la Hailey Bieber, you know, Hailey Bieber, queen of the brownie lip or whatever. Like all Uh. of these publications then picking up on it and crediting her for it are part of the problem. This is an example of, like, maybe Hailey Bieber isn't the problem here, but media is. And I see this happening in many other areas. Oh, absolutely. Where they're advancing. I mean, just as as, as media can legitimize greenwashing and make, turn it into fact by repeating it over and over again, media can kind of erase and at the same time amplify cultural appropriation by repeating over and over again just enough times that Hailey Bieber created that makeup look, Mm -hmm. you know, or many, many other things that Pendleton invented these prints. Yeah, people, people literally don't know. Like people see Pendleton and they think that those designs are original to that company. They don't realize that they were indigenous prints that were being used for a very long time before Pendleton even existed and again there may be young girls out there who see this Hailey Bieber makeup look and think that she created it you know Mm -hmm. yeah and so I think also like in situations like this public figures have a opportunity to really use this situation and try and you know like lift up the community that they're being accused of appropriating like you know, in this situation, I think the ideal 
way for someone like that to have handled it would to be like make another statement or video saying, hey, I shared this makeup look. I thought it looked really great. I just want to let you guys know that this is not something that I came up with. It's something that people have been doing for a really long time. Here are, you know, you could, she could talk about historical examples of people wearing this makeup. She could share her favorite black or Latina beauty creators. And like, Mm -hmm. you know, she could change people's lives sharing these platforms. Absolutely. She has millions of followers. So like, if you, and again, this is not to attack her specifically. I'm just using her as an example because this is something that is really relevant. People are talking about it right now. And part of the reason that people are so upset is because when something like this happens, it takes away opportunity from the people who actually deserve it. You know, there are so many beauty bloggers, beauty content creators that are actually part of the Black and Latino communities that really deserve this platform. And they're being robbed of that because, you know, these magazines want to talk about Hailey Bieber instead. Yeah. Is that Haley's fault? Not necessarily. It's really comes down to, you know, media, how people are consuming things. And I just think that there are a lot of different ways that that could be gone about that would make a much better resolution than what we've seen. Well, and Haley Bieber has a unique power that, you know, you and I don't have, right? Which is that she could, she could change that narrative. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's frustrating to me. I mean, I'm sure someone on her team is thinking about that right now, I hope. But, you know, this is another example of like using your platform, no matter how big it is, to change the narrative, even if it's just for the three people that live in your house. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that these are really important conversations to have, even on an individual level, and to really, you know, set people straight about things. I mean, I think Pendleton always comes back to me time and time again, because it was a brand I knew of that is, you know, so entangled in Portland, which is a place, you know, I lived for a big chunk of my adult life. And I didn't know a lot about the company, but I certainly recognized the origin of their prints. And I mean, I was like, I'm from the East Coast. Like, I don't know anything about the West. I assumed that Pendleton must be a native owned company. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I just assumed. Yeah. And uh, imagine learning otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people would either assume that or, again, in the latter camp, there are going to be a lot of people who have no idea that that's even connected to indigenous culture at all. No, I I would agree. I think that some people probably think it's like, oh, it's Western, Mm -hmm. right? Or it's Portland or Pacific Northwest. I mean, Mm -hmm. certainly calling their collection with America opening ceremony, the Portland collection, definitely erased the origin of those prints. Absolutely. And again, with stripping identifying information, like, you know, native culture is not a monolith. There are so many different tribes that these prints and patterns are coming from specific groups of people. And there are ways to find out who it's coming from. So it's not just, you know, It's all native. They're all the same. Like you could sit down and pull a specific textile and work with people to find out what specific tribe that textile is from. Right. And right. And like, how is this benefiting that tribe? It's not at all. And it's not. Yeah. And the thing is, is that a lot of these large companies, if they genuinely loved the culture and respected the culture and wanted to amplify it and uplift it, there are ways that you can do that. You can use your wealth, you can use your resources and your platform to, for example, they could partner with a specific Native community, they could staff the project with Indigenous people that they were paying the same full salary that they would pay white people, and they could you know, they could take less of a profit. They could provide a history lesson and illuminate the culture and the society along with the products that they're selling. Like there are ways they could go about this in which it would garner way less criticism. People would probably like be really cool with it because that would be like a really great opportunity for a lot of people. But most brands don't want to do that. It's too much work and it's not enough money. I'm not going to say why or how I know this, but I want to say like I know for certain, um, have received this information directly that, you know, Pendleton sells a lot of their blankets, which, you know, they are made with prints that, you know, were stolen 
mm-hmm. from various tribes. They do a pretty significant amount of business selling those blankets yep. to the members of those tribes yeah. for use in both like, you know, as baby gifts and also like as an integral part of funeral ceremonies. That's probably not the right term. I don't know. I was like, it's not exactly funeral, but you know what I mean? Like it's part. Right. Like burial rites or. Burial rites. Yeah. yeah. It's actually a key element of the lives of Native Americans yeah. in the Pacific Northwest. Right. So I want you to think about this for a moment. This is a company that stole these prints, is making money off of them, and then is selling these blankets back to the people where these prints originated. Like, it's unethical in so many ways. And there are ways that this could change, right? I Absolutely. Right, like you were saying, like, okay, let's get a lot of the white people out of this story and get like the actual members of these tribes working for this company, being paid a good wage that is equivalent to their white counterparts. Let's give credit where credit is deserved. And yeah, take a smaller cut of the profits. Then maybe this turns around. But like as it exists right now, it's really troubling to me. It's terrible. And I mean, this, you know, again, the Pendleton has been around for a very long time. They've been doing this for decades and decades now. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of companies that, you know, have done this over the years. And like, this is still happening today. There are new companies that are still doing this. Um, the most recent one I can think of is the White Lady Mahjong Company. Oh, my God. This <laughs> one, is this still happening? Because that I, was embarrassing. I don't know whatever ended up happening to them. I'm, like, a little scared to look it up um, because I, I'm, like, afraid that they're just totally fine and selling these sets to I people. I don't want to think about it. Also, okay, so do you want to tell people a little bit about this? Yes. Yeah, so I I didn't really do research. This is just me kind of going off of what I remember from when this was, like, a news story, I think, about a year or two ago. But it was basically, like, these two or three white women who I want to say grew up playing Mahjong or like played it together and really loved it and like that was like their thing in their friendship was that they would get together and play which is great that's totally fine they decided they wanted to make their own company they were going to create their own Mahjong sets um, with their own tiles and the thing with this game is not only is it culturally significant in China, but also the tiles, like the things that are on the tiles are also significant. Like they have meaning. They're not just like cute symbols for fun. They're, they have specific cultural meaning. And so these ladies just like made their own tiles with basically like cute shit on them. They were like, this one has bunnies on it now, which like you're taking the actual meaning out of it. And just making it, like, an aesthetic thing. Right. And so, obviously, people were like, this is insane. And they had a very brief chunk of, like, history of the game on their website. And their the history that they offered was basically, like, Mahjong was brought over by the Chinese to America. It became really popular in New York, specifically in Jewish communities. And a lot of, like, older Jewish women play and they really love the game, and it, like, is a way for them to come together and socialize and whatever, and that was kind of all they said about it. So they basically, like, uh, Uh. decided to completely ignore the, like, I think thousands of years of history and kind of just (laughs) talk about, like, and here's where the white people came in, which, like, is just, you're yeah, you're just missing, like, so much backstory for that it's totally fine to talk about contemporary history and how the game has been adopted by people but it's problematic when you're just failing to mention the actual culture in which this originates and so not only did they neglect to tell the history they changed the actual you know aesthetic of the game in a way that they felt was like more cute or palatable but they basically marketed it as like a we've revamped this game for mm-hmm. western audiences they called it not your mama's mahjong in case you were wondering which like wh- why we don't who needs that <laughs> like for I know. who and asked for that you know the other thing that just like pisses me off i mean there are like nine thousand things that piss me off and one is that this place is still in business and oh, posted yeah. on instagram as recently as 10 hours ago although mm, now they're surprising. trying now they're trying to show some they have one set that has like traditional chinese mm-hmm. art um these sets 
are $325 to $425. And you want to know what I I am so sure that if you looked into their production and their manufacturing, who do you think is making these? Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> the same factories that make regular mahjong tiles, yeah. I would not be surprised if... East Asian women are making these sets and being paid next to nothing so that they can sell them for $400 and pocket most of them. Uh. Which, like, if that isn't the ultimate irony, like... And so, you know, I think this was, like, a really ex- a good example of just, like, a very obvious form of staking claim and taking credit. Um, people were upset by this, rightfully, but they're still in business. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was also that another like a white lady kanji company oh as well. Same thing where they were like, we're making it healthier. And I was, I, oh, yeah, I just, it's funny to me because, and I think this goes back to people not feeling empowered to speak up when they know something is wrong or not knowing how to articulate it. And so hopefully listening to this conversation will help all of you articulate that in the future but like tell me that there was not one person with these mahjong ladies or the kanji people who were like you know there might be something wrong here yeah like how how well and it's just like it's like you said it's such a learning opportunity there's such a beautiful history to food to games to clothing to art like there's so much that you could learn there that you're just choosing to ignore um you know the brief Mm -hmm. mention of history that they did say when they talked about this game you know there is a very rich communal history of chinese immigrant populations and jewish immigrant populations working together and living in community in new york in lower manhattan where i live and that's a beautiful history there is a story to be told there and they chose not to tell that one either yeah exactly i don't they were just like this is cute we're gonna make money yeah, pretty much they were saying I, the copy was something like this is mahjong for the stylish masses or something it was so offensive uh, and, and that's the thing is that when you use words like that you're implying that the people that you would expect to be playing this game are not stylish yeah that they that their aesthetics are bad or like not cool or like again with the kanji company like if she says oh it's you know it's healthier like the implication to that word is that it's better yeah so you're saying that you are making a dish that has been prepared for probably thousands of years you're making it better now like come on let's not let's not do that yeah not only saying that but then also making money off of it I know. And, like, are you giving that money back to the community in any way? Because I highly doubt it. And once again, like, no one in your life said something to you about this? Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer. 
But Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro business. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made to measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. And that's Gabriella with one L. Gotta get that spelling right. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at Thumbprint Detroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single-stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. I told you the story about a collection of clothing we did at uh, a nasty gal that was 100%, I mean, like you, not even up for a debate, appropriated from traditional Chinese clothing, right? Mm-hmm. And I said in the meeting when I saw the designs, this is like bad. Like we, mm-hmm. we can't do this. And someone else was like, oh, no, it's okay. It's inspired by... It was a line from that year. I don't know if it was Balenciaga. I don't know who it was. But they, the designer, the this huge design house had totally engaged in some, like, egregious cultural appropriation. I got to track down who it was. And so we were copying it. 
basically. Right. But the argument there, which you and I both know is not not a good argument, uh, not a valid argument, was, yeah, but, like, Balenciaga did it, so it's okay. And you're like, wait, no, it's still wrong. And we had multiple meetings where, like, I would say half of the buying team was like, we can't do this, this is wrong. And the other half was like, why are you so uptight? It's fashion, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's not like someone was getting in our face, like, trying to fight with us about it, but it was like what we were saying was being invalidated as well. And then, you know, when the product came in, they did a marketing photo shoot in Chinatown in LA. And I'm still, you know, it's like disappeared from the internet, unfortunately. Uh, yep. But it's so, the whole thing was so egregious that sometimes I'm like, did that really happen? I've had to talk to other friends who work there and be like, do you remember that? And they're like, yeah, no, that really happened. I remember that meeting. <laughs> and I mean, I think that that like really illuminates the importance of responsibility when it comes to big business, to famous people, to anyone who has a lot of influence and a really large audience. Like you have a responsibility not to be doing this because you normalize that behavior. When a company, a fast fashion company sees big time labels doing this, they think they can do it too. It's fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which obviously the logic is not there. Like this person behaved badly, so therefore I can too. Like, what? That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Um, And then also we have to think about, like, there have been so many examples now of very, very famous, very well-respected fashion designers being horrendous racists. Like, that is not new. Just because they are super successful, super wealthy, people wear them all over the world does not mean that they are not engaging in highly unethical practices like you know look up Dolce and Gabbana look up John Galliano like there are so many examples of that Chanel was a Nazi sympathizer Hugo Boss literally made Nazi uniforms like this is not new this has been happening and just because they're participating in it does not mean that you have the green light to do that as well all of these designers you've just listed have been involved in so many things even recently and we need to shut that down yeah, I mean, they, they're they normalizing the behavior. They're making it seem like it's okay to do that. Or even if it's not okay, that nothing's really going to happen to you. You know, like, oh, that sucks, but they're still rich and successful, so whatever. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's no repercussions. And that really, and you know, when we talk about clothing even, just it's like there is where the trickle-down effect of these bad behaviors is the most apparent because, you know, like, okay, so at some designer who I can't remember did this incredibly culturally appropriated line and then we copied it at Nasty Gal. Well, that is not where the chain ends, right? Because oh, then no. it's like Shein's doing it and then it's appearing on Amazon and then it's like every other cheap fast fashion line out there is doing it and it normalizes it because mm-hmm. the more people see it, the more it just becomes like, oh, what? This is like life. Well, and like, how could it be wrong if everyone's doing it? Right. As it's a very dangerous, it's a very dangerous yeah. mindset. Yeah. Like, there is a lot of bad behavior that a lot of people are partaking in does not make it okay. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. Like, you can, I, I think it's so interesting that you'll hear people say like, well, if everybody's doing it, then it must be okay. You say it out loud just now. It sounds so ridiculous. Yeah, but it's, that, it's that's stupid. real. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's scary. And so, yeah, you know, when it comes to taking credit for things, I, this type of appropriation specifically is very harmful because it erases history, it ignores history, specifically the history of marginalized people. Mm-hmm. Um, there really should be specific names attached to traditions with specific stories. The most respectful way to refer to something is to be as specific as possible. And again, we have the resources to, you know, be specific you know, research is really easy to do. It really doesn't take a long time to kind of figure it out and give credit where it's due. Yeah. So like, just like as a broad example, um, you know, say that you were to eat a Japanese dish. If you were to call that dish Hokkaido style, that would be like the most respectful way of referring to it. You're talking about a specific part of Japan that has its own culture. You know, you're referring to the history, where it originated from. You're giving context to that dish. It's slightly less respectful, but still fine to call it a Japanese dish. Um, You know, then you start to go down to where it's not so respectful to just call it Asian. 
is doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> yeah. And then you would be misappropriating if you called it Korean. Yeah. I so, like, you know, fair. there's 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 levels to it. And it might not always be possible to know where it came from. But, like, there's a very good chance that if you just, like, really quickly looked it up, you could probably figure it out. I mean, we all have a computer in our pocket now. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that if you are someone who is – selling this product if you are a restaurant that has the dish on the menu like you really have a responsibility to do this research and figure it out yes I mean that is like the bare minimum I can't believe we have to spell that out but I also know we have to spell that out yeah okay so then we get into the very last type of cultural appropriation and this type hinges on an imbalance of power so this, again, specifically in Western culture, um, white culture, straight culture, cis culture cannot be appropriated because it is the dominant, powerful culture in our society. Um, this especially are, applies around conversations about hairstyle and clothing. Um, a lot of the beauty norms that are enforced in Western society in workplaces, schools, and other public spaces are centered around white Eurocentric beauty standards. Mm -hmm. So there are certain types of hair or makeup that are deemed like quote unquote clean or appropriate. And, you know, the type of clothing you are wearing, it's regarded very differently depending on your race and your body type. So I see a lot of times that people like to talk about, it's very similar to reverse racism. Um, oh. <laughs> people like to be like, well, you know, black people are appropriating white culture by wearing wigs, which like, oh what? God, it's, I see it unfortunately way too often. Oh, I hate that so much. Like if I just made my hair stand on end. Yeah. Or like, you know they like black people straighten their hair and that's white culture appropriation or, um no that is or, uh, white you know uh, absolutely and so that's the thing is that you can't appropriate the dominant culture um uh -huh. that's actually assimilation which is a whole separate thing um you know assimilation is often necessary for safety it's necessary to advance in a professional mm -hmm. environment it's necessary to have access to opportunity like there are plenty of environments in the states where you are told you can't get in you can't succeed you won't be respected if you don't look a certain way and that certain way is typically based on eurocentric white beauty standards absolutely so yeah the power imbalance there is like very clear um and people like to say you brought this up before that they're like just admiring or complimenting the other culture no. by borrowing from it it's <laughs> cultural appro appreciation yeah so for these people i just have to ask if you're participating in a genuine celebration of another culture are you supporting the people that are actually existing in that culture so if you love to wear your hair in braids and you're like, oh, I wear cornrows because I love black hair. Okay, so are you actively campaigning for hair-based equity in schools? Are you <laughs> campaigning for hair-based equity in workplaces, for barriers to housing? Like, you should be fighting to live in a society in which every single member is genuinely open to wearing their hair any way they want without any cultural or social repercussions because that's not the world we exist in now. Right. There is a power imbalance there. When a celebrity wears their hair in a way that is deemed a black hairstyle and the celebrity is not black, they're often celebrated for it. They're often, you know, it's glamorized. And that same exact hairstyle on black people is oftentimes punished. And that's where the power imbalance comes in. And that's why people get upset when they see someone like Kylie Jenner wearing cornrows and people are like, this looks awesome, you're so cool, whatever, whatever, because that exact same day that Kylie Jenner is posting that cornrow photo, there is a little girl who is being pulled out of the classroom and sent home because her hair is not deemed, like, appropriate for school. Yeah, yeah, I, that's exactly true. And I think, I mean, I, the hair one comes up so often. This very, is one often. where celebrities love to be acting like clowns. I can't mm -hmm. believe it. Like, I see the hair a lot. You know, a different example that has nothing to do with clothing or beauty standards 
uh, is something I was dealing with a few months ago where um, someone who works for my company requested that we start carrying these like, I mean, you've seen them at bad gift shops. They're like these really cheap plastic. And I use this in quotes, Zen gardens that are like for your desk. Have you seen okay. these before? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a, they it's, I remember them from college when I was working at urban outfitters in college, we sold them and you definitely know, like, it's seems like, like a urban yeah, product. It does. Right. And it's just basically like a, like a little plastic box with some sand and rocks. I don't know. It's, it's future garbage for one, right? Um, but also, you know, I said, no, I, I, I don't feel good about that. I think that's cultural appropriation. And the person said, what are you talking about? It's cultural appreciation. And they said, okay, let's like take a walk back here. First off, if you don't trust me on this, please go Google Zen Buddhism, cultural appropriation, because there is a lot. I mean, Zen Buddhists are like, please stop turning our religion into products that you sell like Mm -hmm. these cheap plastic desktop gardens but also just to think like get out your phone and say like what is a zen garden well here you can literally go into google right now type in zen garden the first thing that comes up is you know zen gardens by the 13th century zen gardens were deep or deeply part of japanese living and culture the sole purpose of these gardens was to offer the monks a place to meditate buddha's teaching the purpose of building and upholding the garden is to encourage meditation. Okay, okay. so we see that these spaces have really important spiritual significance. How does that relate to your weird little $9 plastic desktop kit? If you're using it to legitimately meditate, fine. I, I guess I'm okay with it, but I bet you're not. So what are you really culturally appreciating here? Right. You know, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that like appreciation, genuine appreciation takes time, it takes effort, it takes education. And most of the people that claim cultural appreciation are not taking any of the steps to do those things. No, and I will tell you the company that makes these kits makes all kinds of just like novelties. They're not, it's not like this is a company run by Zen Buddhists. This is not affiliated with any Zen Buddhist organization like that it benefits. This is someone who's like, I make cheap shit and then I sell it for a little bit more and I sell a ton of it and it goes in a landfill a few months after someone buys it. Like this is not, you're not appreciating anything unless perhaps you like appreciating throwing stuff in the trash soon. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what you just said is such an important part in this. I think that a lot of appropriation can be avoided by just really looking at like who is making the product, where is the product coming from, what is this company that you're purchasing something from. So like, you know, if you love Mexican textiles, if you love indigenous jewelry, like you should be buying that from companies that are owned and operated by people from those cultures that are making those products. You should not be buying them from Urban Outfitters or whatever. Right, store exactly. Is selling that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, like, a you're being appreciative because you're actually buying the genuine product. You're buying real Native American jewelry when you're buying it from someone that is from that culture. And then this also prevents you from wearing something that you shouldn't be wearing because they're probably not going to sell you a ceremonial item. It's true. Like if they're they in know. that, com- yeah. If you're if they're in that community, they're not going to sell you a headdress to wear to Coachella. That's not going to be <laughs> available to you yes. to purchase from an indigenous person most likely and that like helps you avoid those pitfalls like you're not even going to be put in that situation in the first place because you're not even going to be able to buy it and plus once again like if your intention here is cultural appreciation is honoring the source of these things you you're about to appreciate don't you want to support the communities that created these items i mean that that's if you're really appreciating Yep. You know, the, yes. And once again, these are things that like, maybe you hear it and at first you're like, rude, you're being uptight, you are so sensitive about things, it doesn't even involve you. Like, fine, take a, take a moment with this and just think that through. Like, yes, if this is something that's really important to you, that you really love, that you have this emotional attachment to, then use your money to get it from the right source. 
Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, this especially applies when it comes to businesses and public figures. Like, Mm -hmm. they have the resources to genuinely make a difference in these communities that they're quote unquote appreciating. So do it. Yeah. If you appreciate them so much and you love their makeup, their hair, their like textiles, their jewelry, then like show it, prove it. Go out and, you know, campaign for public policy. Go out and donate your money. Go out and work with community organizations on the ground and actually show how much you appreciate this culture. Absolutely. Yeah. And you just don't you just don't see that. No, you don't. It's it's not true appreciation. No, not at all. <sighs> And so I think this kind of brings us into one more point that I wanted to make just about how like individual behavior and group behavior is very different um, based on like your audience size and your access to resources. Um, When we're talking about cultural appropriation, I feel like celebrities and other public figures, I kind of think of them as groups just mm-hmm. because there's multiple people involved there. Like, oh, yeah. yeah it's a machine. Like, yeah, 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 Kylie Jenner is not an individual. Like, yes, she is a human individual. <laughs> but when she is publicizing, posting on social media, you know, it's a group of people involved there. There is PR. There's management. There's stylists. There's so many people in this group. So, like, generally – it's typically less harmful for an individual person to participate in appropriation because you're not spreading misinformation to a large audience. You're not influencing others to follow in your footsteps, and you're also not normalizing appropriation. And this is why businesses and celebrities get so much flack when they do this is because, again, they have a responsibility to uphold. They have an audience. People are watching them. People emulate them. People see what they're doing and think that that's that's, you know, they should be doing that too. So the more of an influence you have in society, I think the more of a responsibility you have to do the right thing. And at the same time, you're also much more likely to have the resources to like do your research, vet your sources, figure out what you're actually representing here. Mm -hmm. I think you just have way less excuses when you're in the public eye like that. Like, you know, I don't, I highly doubt any major celebrity is coming up with their own Halloween costume. That's the thing, right? I assume that, but then you know that we're going to see a few people dressed as something terrible this year because it's every year. And I know that they didn't make that costume themselves. Multiple people probably were involved in procuring it, you know, assembling it, putting it on their bodies for them. You know, I just don't get it. And yet it happens time and time again. And I think like you might feel as an individual as sometimes you are like, I I just don't even have the bandwidth to learn and know all the things I need to know to be a good person. But like, these are people who have people on their teams who just should be doing stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, that's, there are a lot of people working together there to create these looks or you know to create like if someone launches a business like that is not something that happens overnight there is there's so many moving parts there's so many people involved with that like you have a responsibility when you are trying to reach an audience and I think that not only do we see this in like traditional you know actresses musicians but um, more often I'm now seeing this a lot in the food space especially in people who work as like food content creators or like recipe creators Mm -hmm. Um, there was this whole thing recently about spa water I don't know if you saw that (laughs) yes yeah (laughs) so this whole spa water debacle has been happening Uh, and i just recently saw a video that the women who quote-unquote created spa water were on isn't it agua fresca am i imagining that okay yes yeah (laughs) so they like very clearly were just like ripping something that has existed in mexican culture forever and just like putting a new name on it and basically whitewashing it and you know it became a joke people were like this is stupid and they were making fun of them and like in in this case, I'm like, eh, you know, I don't blame people for making fun of them. <laughs> and I just recently saw a video in which the woman was, I think she was on some sort of talk show, but basically she was like, 
well, what am I supposed to like do a bunch of research on like every single recipe and every oh, single thing I post? Yes. The answer God. is yes. Yes. There, the answer like, there is very clear. Good yes. Lord. Yeah. Like, I if mean- <laughs> you want to have a public platform, if you want an audience, if you want thousands of people to watch your videos, like share your content, buy your cookbook or whatever, you have a responsibility to do the work. It's work. And if you don't want to do that work, then like maybe being in the spotlight is not for you. I mean, these businesses, these new, like the Mahjong ladies, the kanji people, I mean, there's tons of other, there's so much of this in the food area. Mm -hmm. I am always like, didn't you probably get like investment money to start this business? You're telling that no, you're telling me that no one questioned this and that you didn't have to do any due diligence around this in order to get that money. It's shocking to me. I, I guess what I'm saying as I'm talking out loud is they must not, they must have had so much financial privilege, generational wealth, whatever around them or in their own lives that they didn't have to do that work because I, I just cannot understand otherwise how these things happened. I mean, because trust me, Yes, I've had some trouble shutting down down some really bad ideas in my career, but I also have successfully shut down some other really bad ideas in my career. I cannot emphasize enough that I have been in some meetings where I've heard some really, really bad ideas. Yeah. <laughs> that are really messed up and mm-hmm. were definitely cultural appropriation would be like an understatement for some of these things. And so I like I will tell you I worked somewhere where the creative director said to me, I'd really like you to hire someone black for the buying team so that we could never be accused of cultural appropriation again. Oh my God. I mean, that's a real thing that happened, everyone. And yet, like, still, we catch so many of these things before they come to fruition, but then suddenly we've got these... The Mahjong ladies, I I still can't. I'm still reeling that they're still in business. I I want to know who bought those. It's upsetting, but it's also not surprising. I think that... Again, a lot of the people who feel extreme guilt around this conversation, um, like, double down on it. Mm -hmm. And they're probably willing to support a business like this because they feel like they're under attack somehow, that it's, like, personal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that's a good call out because I frequently see, I mean, we know this is what's happening in our culture right now, right? That people are, like, doubling down on this as sort of, like, a culture war, you know, mm-hmm. if you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. 
Country Feedback is a mom-and-pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul, and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl, or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns, handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed, made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. The Pewter Thimble is a curated secondhand shop based out of Rome, Italy. Owner Desiree Marie Townley has a background in costuming and makeup for dance and opera and focuses on dressing for the character you want to be in the world. Curated collections are dropped in a story sale and always have a specialized theme like the color palette of Starry Night, the film classic Casablanca, and the children's novel The Secret Garden. Desiree works with local artisans, and pieces are rescued from markets and rehabilitated and resold with worldwide shipping. The Pewter Thimble is a collection of pieces that will have eternal style from the eternal city. Discover more on Instagram at The Pewter Thimble. Really what it comes down to for all of this is to just shut up and listen to people (laughs) yeah just that's it just just listen just listen be respectful actually take a moment to think about where someone else is coming from what their perspective is and if people say you know I this makes me uncomfortable I am offended by this I'm hurt by this like actually listen to them think about why they might be saying what they're saying Think mm-hmm. about what their perspective is. And if you don't understand, ask questions. You know, like, wh- wh- why is this hurtful to you? What can I do to fix it? Like, this is not something that is like, oh, well, I already did it too late now. Like, you yeah. can make steps to address it. And I think that, and this is with so many other things that, you know, we're dealing with day to day. It's just so important to just take a step back and listen to what other people are saying. Right, right. We've all made mistakes in our lives. We all don't know everything. But take that moment to listen and to learn and be open. I guess I think that's what so many, so many people shut down when this conversation starts. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you don't need to. It, 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 it's going to benefit you and the world as a whole. So just listen. Nobody's coming for you. I mean, clearly these Mahjong ladies are still going strong, right? And they're like, they're engaging in something yeah. super egregious, right? Like, your life will be okay. Yeah, and I mean, I think that this could be said for a lot of different circumstances, but like, I just like to think of it as you have to put yourself through short-term discomfort for long-term growth. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it might suck in the moment. It might feel really shitty. You might be really embarrassed. You might feel really shameful, guilty. Um, It doesn't feel good to know that you've hurt someone else, Mm -hmm. but you have to really think about that and like accept it in order to move on from it. Um, You know, and then you'll be better in the long run. You will be less likely of having to go through that feeling again Mm -hmm. because you'll be less likely of making the same mistake. And you'll come out of it a better person. Like, isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it to feel like shit for a couple days, maybe even a couple weeks um, of feeling really embarrassed in order to move past that and be better? Absolutely. Like, the payoff is huge there. It feels totally worth it to me. It does. It does. And, I, you know, the reality is that for most of us, like, some, if, if you – I don't know, are culturally appropriating at this point with like your Halloween costume or some fabric that you bought or whatever, the stakes are low for you as an individual. And and you shouldn't, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't cling to it or feel this incredible, like paralyzing sense of shame. Like, I mean, listen, I, I get messages from people who are like just tearing themselves apart because they shopped at Target last week. Like we can't, we can't do that. But what we can do as as a larger mass of people is just do better on the individual level and influence the people around us to do the same. And that's when we how how we make these larger systemic cultural changes where we make it Mm -hmm. that no group of white women would ever decide that they were going to start a Mahjong company. Right. That's the world. Me too. Me too. And that's how we get there. (laughs) And that's how all of us play a role in us, this because none of us are Haley Bieber. None of us are Kendall Jenner. Like we don't have millions of people waiting to hear what we are going to do next. But what we can mm-hmm. do is work with everyone else around us to change what the norm is, to make it at a point where no one would think that any of these things are okay. Yeah. And just having these conversations, like talking about this with your friends, with your family, or even being one of those people that leaves a comment online that like, you know, a musician that you really like does something that you find harmful, like by speaking up and being one of the people that comments on it, like it makes a really big difference to people if they see a post and they see two comments disagreeing and 2000 comments disagreeing. Absolutely. And if they know you, it's even bigger. Absolutely. And like that will change people's minds. That will change people's opinions. If they see something and they see all of these people saying, hey, I think this is really problematic. I think this is really harmful. That's going to cause who knows how many people to sit down and be like, hmm, maybe it is. A lot of people are saying it. So like be part of that. Be, you know, use your voice. And this is something that you say a lot with Clothes Horse about like, holding people accountable, holding brands accountable. Like you may feel like you're just one person, but we're all one person in a very large group of people. It does make a difference. It really does. It does. I know that sometimes it feels you're just like a grain of sand in this huge desert, but you really, you're part of a lot of grains of sand that make that desert. And, you know, Mm -hmm. we, we, when we work together, like our power is so, I mean, I was caught one time in a dust devil and that must have been like, you know, I don't know, thousands of grains of sand blowing around me into my nose and eyes and mouths. And you know what? Very meaningful moment for me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we think about it, like we just lived through and are continuing to live in a global pandemic, mm. that is something that started very small. Yeah. It started with what? One or two people? And it affected literally every single person on the entire and planet. And it still is. Yeah, absolutely. Like, we are going to see the effects of this for who knows how long, probably decades. Like, you know, and you can think the same with an idea. And maybe instead of a pandemic, it could be a positive idea. (laughs) You can spread that positive idea, but it's that easy. It is that easy, yeah. Yeah, you talk to two people. If only one of those people talks to five people, if only one of those people talks to another two people, like the next thing you know, like your entire community could be changed. It's totally true. I mean, like even, you know, from a capitalism perspective, like this is how companies look at word of mouth advertising. Basically, like if they give you a good as experience as a customer, you're going to go tell two people, then they're each going to tell two people. And this is like a thing that is an integral Mm -hmm. part of marketing that I want us to use 
for the force of good, you know? And I, I think that that is how it works. Also, you know, something I had mentioned to you, because this is another thing that whenever I try to have these conversations at work, it's always like, well, my husband is, is Japanese and he said, this is okay. Or I, mm-hmm. my friend, my friend is Native American and she said, this doesn't offend her. We can't do that. We cannot say like, I had the conversation with one person in a situation that may not have even felt equal and they agreed with me. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a very valid point is that person may have agreed with you in the moment because they felt some sort of pressure mm-hmm, to agree. Mm-hmm. They might not be telling you the truth. They could be lying to you because they, you know, it's and the thing is, is it's not anyone's individual responsibility to like give people lessons or educations on racism. And frankly, there are a lot of people are color, people of color who are sick of it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I do not blame any black person, any Native American person for being like, I am tired of educating white people. I am sick of being people's personal teacher and doing all this labor and making nothing off of it. So like, you know, there are probably a lot of circumstances in which you say, hey, is this like offensive or funny? And people will literally just lie to your face because the alternative is free labor and they're not interested in doing that. Yeah. Or take it, take it to an even more basic level sometimes people just agree with you because they don't want to hurt your feelings or they just want to have a nice Absolutely. dinner or, you know, mm-hmm. they're tired and they just don't want to get into it. Like, pe- you know, Absolutely. people will be like, no, that outfit looks fine, but be like, eh, it, I've seen better to themselves. You know, like you cannot ask one person in your life to be the spokesperson for an entire group of people. Never in any any circumstance. circumstance. And at the end of the day, too, like, there are terrible people in every community. (laughs) Real (laughs) talk. Yeah. Yeah. There there are assholes everywhere. Assholes look like anything. Uh, So just because one person is cool with something awful doesn't mean that the thing isn't awful. That's terrible logic to use. I know. Like, there are plenty of people out there who find grossly offensive shit super funny. Yeah. Uh, that is not a good representation for the Absolutely. Whole. You know, I every time I do a post on Instagram about small businesses, one person has to message me or comment about how, well, I know a small business where the owner is terrible. Yeah. What do you want me to say? Sure. Yeah. I'm not surprised. There are terrible people everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There are awful people in every facet of society so we can't you know again these cultures like no culture is a monolith no one person is a spokesperson or representative for any community Um, everyone's going to have their own opinion it's just looking at what like a lot of people are saying and just thinking about what's respectful you know like if you, If you were to participate in something that, like, one person not from the community says is offensive, I wouldn't blame you for being like, is this valid? But if a whole bunch of people are being like, hey, you should rethink this, like, listen. Listen, do your research, figure it out. There is plenty of information out there. Unfortunately, doing the right thing takes effort. And there's yeah, no, really there's no way to cheat your way to doing things in the most ethical way, period. If someone is selling you a shortcut to doing things right, uh, it's probably not valid. Yeah, that's so true. It is, it takes so much work to do things right. It is. To do things in the least harmful way, to do things in a way that supports the people around you. It's difficult. Like it takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. And again, if you don't want to do that, if you're lazy, if you don't care, then say that. Literally, literally say that. I want you to hear yourself say it out loud. Yeah. If you're like, I am really lazy and I don't feel like looking anything up. So I'm just going to call it what I want to call it and fuck anyone who's upset by that. Then like, okay, you can do that. You're just literally saying that you have no respect you do not care. All you care about is yourself and people are going to call you out for that. Yeah. I, you know, I always wonder about people who really, or at least say that out loud, right? A long time ago. I mean, this was when I was in college, I went to a party and there was a guy there in blackface, white guy, blackface. I know. I mean, right. Like I, I, I can't believe that I witnessed this in real life, but I know it happens. And horrible. horrible. And I said to him, don't you feel like your costume's kind of fucked up? 
And he was like, why? I don't care what anybody thinks. I literally don't care about anyone's feelings or how they feel about this because this is what I wanted to do. And I was like, wow. All right. Okay. I mean, and a yeah, conversation. Then, like, yep. And that's uh, like, uh, I don't know. I don't even... have a comeback for that. But if you're going to live in that, good luck. Yeah, and that's the thing. There are plenty of people out there who are openly racist, openly bigoted. And if you are not one of those people, if you do not want to be, like, clumped in with those people, if you don't want to be perceived as one of those people, then think about what you're doing. Think about how you're walking through the world. Yeah, I I think so. I mean, I really doubt that you feel that you don't care what anybody else thinks. So once again, like, say it out loud. Say, like, I don't care about other people or I don't care about other people's feelings or whatever it is, see how that feels for you. Unfortunately, when we talk about cultural appropriation, that's what you're, we're really talking about. Yeah. And I I think it's also interesting that like the stakes there for most forms of appropriation, the benefits are so like silly and insignificant. I know. So like, When it comes to, you know, wearing your hair a certain way, wearing a certain outfit, like, what do you get from that? Like, the benefit is that you look cool or you feel cute. So, like, to you, it's more important to temporarily look cute than to hurt a bunch of people's feelings. Yeah. Like, what's the trade-off there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, why why is that so important? Like, that just seems so – and again, a lot of times it's more nefarious. Like, people are like, I'm trying to make a boatload of money or become famous from that. (laughs) And, like, that's a whole – you know, that is a much darker intention. But, like, most of the time that people are doing this, it's like – I want to seem cool or come off a certain way or be perceived as like cute or sexy or whatever in, in exchange for like, what, is it worth it? Yeah, probably not. Is it worth it? Yeah. Is it worth it to like have a quote unquote funny costume and a couple people laugh and that's worth offending like a ton of people to you? I mean, I want to know who those people are who laugh because I just don't even think you want to be friends with them, but (laughs) <laughs> yeah, at this point, I think a lot of people do laugh because they're uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I find, especially as a woman, that I often laugh when I'm uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of that is just like a defense mechanism. Um, it's not always, again, it's not always safe to speak out. It's not always safe to express how upset you are. So I think a lot of times, like, you just do that nervous laugh because you're like, this is so weird and I don't know what to do. Oh, I catch myself doing that all the time. It's a hard habit to unlearn. And I don't blame anyone for not stepping up in the moment. Like, I've been there many times where I've seen something that I didn't find right and wasn't able to speak up in the moment and I look back on it and I'm like I really wish I had said something but oftentimes like it can be very paralyzing you know especially depending on your surroundings who you're with like what your dynamic Mm -hmm. is with the people that surround you it's not always like you don't always have the opportunity to say something it's true and I think that's another really important reason why it's important to have as many people on board with Mm -hmm calling out cultural appropriation because absolutely because there is safety in numbers unfortunately i mean that Mm -hmm. is that is the truth there are definitely situations it's interesting like i will call these things out at work and feel pretty okay about it i mean it took me years to be able to do that uh definitely early in my career when we were absolutely appropriating tons of native american prints like every single day except for that one year when we were really into shibori dyeing That was really offensive, too. Uh, Back then, I didn't feel like I could say anything, but I felt really like, uh, like, this is wrong. And now I have to write an order for this. And, you know, over time, I became more confident and could call that out. But there are many situations in my personal life where I've seen things like this. And I have felt very fearful of, Mm -hmm. it's not even like you're confronting someone, but you know that that's how that's going to go. And if, if it were... If there were more people around you who shared those feelings and would speak out about them, you wouldn't be afraid to speak out about them. And that's the world I want us to live in where we don't even have to speak out about this because we've already shifted the society, like shifted society as a whole into a direction 
where this just like rarely happens anymore. And so it, calling someone out on it is like just another day thing. You know, it's like telling someone to pick up their dog poop. It's like, oh, of course, totally. right? We all know that, you know? And I think that this is also another important time to maybe like check your privilege and think about like what your – I'm trying to think of how to say this. It's important to think about how your privilege affects the way that you're able to speak up versus other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there is an instance where something is happening and someone speaks up, whether that be in person or online, if you have privilege and you are able to amplify their message or support them in some way, you should use that. You know, if you are a straight white man and someone speaks up and says this makes me uncomfortable like you have you don't really you're not really risking much to support it's them. true it's you're putting very little on the line like your job is probably very safe and secure you probably have you know financial safety nets you might you're more likely to have a support system like you can speak out with a lot less fear than a lot of marginalized people might be able to so you should use that like, it's a really great opportunity for you to step up and be like, hey, I support this message. I want to amplify it. What can I do to help? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's let's use our privilege for good. And we all, all Absolutely. of us have privilege. Yeah. Uh, I think that's totally something I've been trying to call out more and more because I think people hear privilege um, and they think, you know, because all of us, all of us have different obstacles that we face, different adversity. Uh, so we just assume that privilege is something that other people have and not us. But mm -hmm. that's not true. We all have. There it. are so many layers to privilege. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, if you if you don't have straight privilege, you might have able-bodied privilege. Like, you know, if you don't have white privilege, you may have class privilege. Like, there are so many layers to this that like you do have some, mm -hmm. and the more of it that you have, the safer you are, the bigger safety net you have to speak out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we we need to use that. Like acknowledge your privilege so you can be aware of it and feel empowered to mm -hmm. speak out about things. And totally, there's so much power in that. Yeah, there's yeah. so much power in that privilege that can be used for good. Exactly, exactly. Agreed. Well, yeah. Alex, thanks as always for being literally the most well prepared guest. It's such a delight. <laughs> uh, I feel like I just get to sit back and have a really interesting conversation which I love. Everybody, you have no idea the amount of notes Alex brings to the table. And I just, I'm so grateful for it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so funny. Yeah. This is not going to lie. It's three full pages of yes. type. And, and like small, small font, you know, <laughs> listen, the nerdy journalism major in me just cannot show up without pages of no, notes. No, I love it. So. You have no idea. When I opened your notes, I was just uh, delighted <laughs> is an understatement. So thank you so much, Alex, for putting of course. some work into this and you know sharing all of your great knowledge and ideas with everyone. Do you have any final thoughts for anyone or anything you are like working on, you want everybody to know about or anything? Um, I am sure I'm going to think of something like tomorrow and I'm going to be like, Shit, I forgot. But <laughs> as of right now, I think I've covered everything. Um, I really appreciate you having me. It's always such a pleasure to be on Clothes Horse. Um, I know that I have a lot of like friends and internet mutuals that are part of the Clothes Horse community. So hello, friends. Um, <laughs> it's always so great to hear from people when they're they you know, have listened to an episode I was on and really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you for anyone who's ever sent me like a nice message for the episodes I've been on previously. I really appreciate it. And I always have so much fun being on here with you, even when we're talking about serious topics. <laughs> I mean, we're always kind of talking about serious topics, but I will tell you every time you're on an episode, I mean, just so many amazing messages from people who are just so grateful to learn from you. So Anytime oh, thank you, you want to come thank you, thank and you. show up with like four pages of notes, I'm ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll be back soon. <laughs> oh, I know you will. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Thanks again to Alex for being the most thoughtful and prepared guest ever. If I had a trophy here, we'll just envision the trophy. That's what it says. And it's for you, Alex. <laughs> I'm so grateful for her time and expertise, and I hope that she will be back again soon. 
You can find Alex's business, St. Evans, on Instagram as at where underscore saint, that's with the S-T, dot evens. And you can check out her online shop at wheresaintevens.com. I'll share all of that in the show notes. But you can be assured that her passion for knowledge, for information, for telling stories is fully on display with everything in her shop. The show notes for today's episode, as always, will also be full of other articles and resources for learning more about cultural appropriation and seeing some of the stories we discussed in today's episode for yourself. Also, thanks to the Wayback Machine, seriously, I was on a mission. I had to do some deep digging. Then I remembered the Wayback Machine and it got me to where I needed to be, but I also had to figure out what (laughs) month... That horrible Nasty Gal collection dropped. It took a lot of like looking at my calendar. I actually backtracked from when I got engaged. I don't know. It's a very weird year. Anyway, I found a link to that heinous Nasty Gal collection that I mentioned in our conversation. Not all of the horrible photography that I saw in the marketing meetings is in there, is on that page, but I'm guessing it was probably in the emails we sent out and I don't I don't know how to get to that. Maybe that's another uh, mission for me to go on deep into my Gmail inbox. Anyway, take the link that's in the show notes. It will take you to the homepage where you can click onto the collection called Do East. If the link is a little glitchy, just like stay patient and refresh. It was a little weird for me, but then it worked. And like I said, you can click into that collection and see the pieces in there. Uh, Wow, it was a really weird experience for me because at Nasty Gal, in apparel, I managed every category except for dresses. And so I saw, I saw a lot of things we talked about in meetings an awful lot. It was really weird. Okay. Anyway, go check that out. Before we close out things today, I also want to remind you of the upcoming opportunities for all of you small businesses to have a moment on this platform via audio essays and Instagram live panel discussions. You'll find all the essential info in the show notes and on Instagram. All right, lastly, but so much most importantly, I just want to remind you that conversations about cultural appropriation are not meant to shame you. They're not meant to make you feel bad about the costume you wore 15 years ago or for coveting a Pendleton blanket for years. Many of us were there. It's to help all of us be better, more thoughtful humans in this world, to build a better future where no one has to feel like a novelty concept or a mere fraction of a person. By talking about these things, we normalize being good, being thoughtful, having difficult conversations, holding businesses accountable, educating ourselves and those around us. And these are the things that really do lead to major social change. These conversations are just the beginning. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse. Written, researched, edited, hosted, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, uh, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, or even more importantly, just tell a friend or share a story on Instagram or, you know, talk about it with someone else at lunch tomorrow. I don't know. The point of it is, like, let's get more people listening and thinking about these things. If you'd like to support my work financially, you can learn more at patreon.com slash close horse podcast. Um, and I would just like to thank as I always do, Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support. This week marks six years since we got married, uh, which is, I never thought I would get married. I had no interest in it. I was really happy as a single person, but I'm also just really happy to have an incredible partner. And I cannot emphasize enough that Close Horse would not be happening if it wouldn't have been for all the support and knowledge sharing that I get from Dustin. So thank you, Dustin. All right. Bye, everyone. See you next week.